I've got Alexis and I've got Katie, and both of these girls come today to give their life to Jesus and be baptized. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have you repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son of the living God, and I accept him now, and I accept him now as my Lord and Savior, as my Lord and Savior. All right. Well, Katie's going to go first. So Katie, upon your confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and cover your nose. And Alexis, upon your confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
glimpse into one of our missions partners over in the Philippines. Because of your generosity, they have been able to plant seven churches over there, and one of them is so big right now that they're having to expand. I feel like that deserves another round of applause. How exciting. I love that generous is who we are and we are able to support things like that. You can give your tithes and offerings in the drop boxes, the giving wall, 1c.church, or text the number behind me. Will you join me in prayer over our offering? Father, we thank you so much and how you are moving. Thank you for helping us to be generous, use the blessings that you give us to give back to better your kingdom. Please just bless this, um, bless our offerings and our tithes and just put it on our hearts today. It is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you'll stand with us, we'll continue to worship this morning in song. Let's sing these words together, church, come on. See, I search the world, but it couldn't fail.
good, good father. Sing it out to him. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. And I'm supplies, or money, or Ziploc bags, or trappers that were bought and purchased in Florida and shipped here for us. We even had tiny little preschoolers bringing in school supplies during vacation Bible school. Because of that, local families were able to receive quality school supplies as a gift because of your generosity. That free and generous gift was appreciated more than we will ever know. The day after the giveaway, I had a lot of supplies left over, so I offered it up to people to come and get from the church office. At least four people cried while picking up their school supplies. One woman shared with me that she was a single mom who works a full-time job, but was still only going to be able to get probably half of the school supplies and not near as good a quality. Her tears of gratitude fell down her face whenever she received her free gift. She thanked us over and over again and said, I'm never going to be able to repay you, but you have no idea what this means to my family. Can we relate? We've received a free and overly generous gift from our heavenly father through Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life with Christ Jesus our Lord. Endless amounts of time and love effort and sacrifice have been put into every single one of us and we should be brought to tears of gratitude because of his free gift of salvation as you walked in you should have been handed a prepackaged communion cup the top holds the bread which represents his body and the bottom the juice the blood that was shed for us take a moment to just reflect on that free gift that we have received i will pray and then you can partake as you're ready Father, we thank you so much for this time together that we can worship you, that we can think about that free gift that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. We thank you for that. Just have it on our hearts today and just bless this service. We love you and we praise you. It is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church, if you'd stand up with me one more time. After this song, our high school pastor, Jacob Bolito, and Shane are gonna team preach a message called, This Is My Story. And it's just talking about the importance and the value of your testimony. So we figured we'd do this song. It's a new one for us, so I gotta teach it to you. It's by Matthew West. It's called, My Story and Your Glory. It goes like this. My story. Your glory, my pain, and your purpose, my mess, and your message, and all things I know you're working. One life, one mission, one reason why I'm living all for you, but not for me, or my story, your glory. Church, let's sing that again. Sing my story. Well, my story, your glory, well, my pain, and your purpose, my mess, your message, and all things I know you're working. One life, one mission, and 
Chapter the you can use Like Isaiah said, we're going to do things just a little different today. My buddy Jacob is going to help me out with the message. But before we dive in, I wanted to give you just a couple of real fast announcements. The first is this is the last weekend to sign up for Rooted. And so if you've not signed up yet for Rooted, do that after the service out in the lobby. Casey will get you all taken care of, but you don't want to miss this opportunity. And then the second is after the 1045 service is over, over in the fellowship hall, we're going to have our first step event. This is an opportunity if you're newer to our church where you can come and get to know our staff a little bit better, get to know more about the church, and maybe have some of your questions that you have answered. So I want to invite you out. It'll probably start right around 1145 today in the Fellowship Hall, which is just right over there. Well, several years ago, pastors Whit Criswell and John Hampton, they were attending a church leadership conference over at Willow Creek Church up in the Chicago area. And one day they attended a session about sharing your faith that was being taught by Nancy Beach, who was on their staff at that time. And it was in her message that she talked about some people that she'd been trying to reach, people that God had placed on her heart. And she named one of those individuals by name. And she said that it was a neighbor of hers and how she'd been trying to help bring him into a relationship with Jesus. 
Well, the next day, Witt and John, they decided that they were going to skip out on some of the conference, conference sessions and instead go play around a golf. And so the golf that day was a little bit slow. And the two of them, they ended up eventually catching up to the twosome in front of them. And they decided that the four guys would play golf together. Well, they went around and started to introduce themselves to each other. And one of those, one of those guys in that twosome that they caught up with, he shared his name. And Witt and John, they immediately recognized the name, of, uh, the name being that of uh, Nancy Beach's neighbor. Now, they didn't say anything about this, but these guys were completely blown away by it. There's over 3 million people in the greater Chicago area. There's over 100 different golf courses, and here they are. They're matched up with the one man that Nancy Beach said that she'd been praying for. And Nancy sees neighbor, she said to the guys, said, well, what brings you guys to Chicago? And we said, well, we're here for a, a church growth conference and talked about the church for a minute. And he says, you know, that's, that's the church that my neighbor works at. Her name's Nancy Beach. Have you ever heard of her? And Witt said that he wanted to say, yeah, we've heard of you too. But he didn't. He just said, yeah. And Nancy, she spoke earlier this week at the conference. And the conversation, it went on for a little while. And at one point, the man asked Witt Criswell, how long have you been in ministry? Now, Witt's a guy who has an incredible story. Witt used to be a really successful banker over in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. But he developed a really bad gambling addiction. And it was during this time that he embezzled thousands of dollars from his bank. And right about the time that he knew that he was going to be caught, he wrote a suicide note to his family. He took a pistol and he headed outside of town and he prepared to take his life. But he just, he couldn't bring himself to do it. And so he came back and he faced the music and he went to prison. But it was while he was in prison that Wayne Smith, a, a preacher at that time at the Southland Christian Church, he came to the prison and he helped lead Wit into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, Nancy's neighbor, he was riveted by Wit's story. He said that his own father had been a compulsive gambler and that their family had suffered from his father's obsession. And then he says to Wit, he says, Wit, how on earth were you ever able to conquer your addiction? And Wit he explained that during the heartache of that personal failure, he accepted Jesus Christ. And he said that he overcame his gambling and he found this, this new life in Jesus where he'd been freed from his addiction. And that evening, whenever Witt and John went back to the conference, they immediately sought out Nancy Beach. They had told her what happened. And they said that Nancy, she just stood there and she cried. She couldn't believe what had taken place, how, how God had orchestrated that whole get together during that afternoon. And then whenever Witt returned to Kentucky, he went ahead and he sent Nancy's neighbor his entire story. And then just a few weeks later, Nancy said that her neighbor became a Christian. And you never know how your story might be used in the process. It was Nancy's story that planted the seed. It was Nancy's prayers and the prayers of others that, that gave it the power. But it was Witt's story that this man was able to connect to. It was able to relate to. And there's just something powerful about your story. And that's how the Apostle Paul would share his faith. He would share his story with people. In fact, if you've been reading through the book of Acts this month, you've probably seen that there was three different times that the Apostle Paul would share his story with others. And today we're going to be studying out of Acts chapter 26. We're going to see a really dramatic moment in the life of the Apostle Paul. By the time you get to Acts 26, Paul has now been in prison for about two years for sharing his faith. And about that time, Governor Festus is going to receive word from King Agrippa that he's going to come to town for a visit. And Festus, he, he had heard that Agrippa was fascinated by Christianity, that he was fascinated by Paul, and so he was going to arrange for a meeting for the two individuals. He also wanted to get the king's opinion on what he should do about this whole Paul situation. And so today we're going to see the prisoner Paul come face to face with the most powerful man in all the land. In Acts chapter 26, it's going to give us a great example of how we can share our faith by sharing our story. I think it's safe to say that we all love a good story. In fact, we, we remember things through stories. This morning, if I were to ask how many of you remember what I preached about three weeks ago, I would bet the very few of you would be able to answer that, and that's okay. But if I were to say... How many of you remember the story about the time that I burned the side of my house with a flamethrower? I bet hands would go up all across this room. And it's because stories stay with us. And that's why whenever Jesus would teach or preach, he would tell stories that the people were able to relate to. Maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, my story's boring. There's, there's nothing exciting about my story. 
Well, you need to know that God, he can use your story to reach people that nobody else is going to be able to reach. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to break down Paul's approach to sharing his faith with King Agrippa into three different phases. And so this morning, Jacob is going to get us started. So first, let's talk about how Paul breaks down barriers. In Acts 26, 1 through 3, he says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You may speak in your defense. So Paul, gesturing with his hands, started his defense. I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you are the one hearing my defense today against all these accusations made by Jewish leaders. For I know you are an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. Now please listen to me patiently. First, we see he's polite. He's respectful to the king. Paul saw the parade of people when King Agrippa came to town. And so he's going to join in with the other important people, and he's going to give compliments to the king and be respectful. Pastor Rick Warren says, we are never persuasive when we're abrasive, which is so true. If there is anything I learned when I was the children's intern here, it was that you can never come on too strong. You have to be patient, kind, and willing to listen. Second, you see him start talking about what they have in common. And like me, I'm sure you are all wondering what a king and a prisoner has in common. Well, you see, Paul finds common ground when he says, I know you are an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. Paul is an expert too. Before Paul became a Christian, he was one of the up-and-coming religious leaders of his time. Paul and King Agrippa were both people who were anxiously waiting the return of the promised Messiah. You see, Paul found something they had in common, and he broke down the barriers by being able to relate to the king. And you see, Jesus was also a master at breaking down barriers. He could start a conversation with the woman at the well and completely change her life. He could have a conversation with Zacchaeus and transform his life. He could talk to Nicodemus about being born again. And in Acts 26, it shows us that the Apostle Paul was pretty impressive himself. Here's a prisoner, face to face with the king, and he turns the conversation to spiritual issues. And he uses that to break down barriers. And the next thing that I want us to see is how Paul shares his story. You see him start talking about how he grew up. And then in verses six through eight, he says, now I'm on trial because of the hope and fulfillment I, of God's promise made to our ancestors. In fact, that is why the 12 tribes of Israel zealously worship God night and day, and they, have share, they share the same hope I have. Yet, your majesty, they accuse me for the, having this hope. Why does it seem incredible to any of you that God can raise the dead? See, he tries to get them to focus on the facts now. And now he's going to lump himself in there. In verses 9 and 11, he says, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison. And I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had punished them in synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. You see here, he is getting ready to start talking about his conversion experience. He looks at them and he says, Festus, Agrippa, let me tell you what happened to me. You see, I was on my way to persecute Christians and torture them. But, and I was on the road to Damascus and then suddenly a bright light shined from heaven. And it blinded me for three days. And then I heard a voice from heaven, and it said, or I said, who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And then Jesus said, I have appeared to you so that you can become a witness on my behalf. And then he tells them, guys, you're not going to believe it. I was blind for three days. And then another Christian came to me, and that Christian's name was Ananias. And do you know what he did? He healed me. And then he tells them, that, he, that Ananias told him that you need to get up and be baptized. And he told them, after that, I have never been the same. And you see, we, we hear a story like Paul's and we think, man, if I had a story like Paul's, it'd be so much easier to tell mine. But 
mine is so boring. Why would anybody want to hear my story? But when it comes to your story, whether it's dramatic or not, it's your story, and God blessed you with that. And you need to be able to tell it. Whenever I try and prompt our youth kids into taking that step of faith and sharing their story, I, I use Jesus as an, as an example, because Jesus is the ultimate example. Anything Jesus did back then is still applicable to our lives today. So let's look at John 9 for an example. This is where Jesus heals the blind man, and the religious leaders were furious with Jesus for healing somebody on the Sabbath. But Jesus healed this blind man by putting mud on his eyes, and that was considered work back then. And that is why the religious leaders were mad with Jesus. But those religious leaders got a hold of that man, and they said, tell us the truth. Jesus is a sinner, isn't he? And in John 9, 24 through 25, the man says, whether or not he is a sinner, or I don't know, but there is one thing I do know. I was blind, but now I can see. And that was his story. It was short, it was sweet, and it was true. And that is what made that story so powerful. See, your story does not need to be huge. What matters is that it is your story. God blessed you with that story. So whether it is simple or complex, it is a fantastic story, and we need to be able to share our stories. So the whole point of this sermon series is to help you and equip you with the knowledge and the resources and the confidence to be able to share your stories and your faith with others. And that's right. And so what I want to do right now is I want to give you some, some scripture that you can use whenever you're sharing your story, whenever you're telling others about Jesus. These are the scriptures that I would use if I were sharing my faith with someone. And so the, the first two that I want us to see, it's Romans chapter 3, verse 10, and also verse 23. They say this, no one is righteous, not even one. And then verse 23 says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And it's our sin that separates us from a perfect and holy God. And in Romans 6, in verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I really love that word gift that he uses there because it shows that's not anything that you and I are going to do. It's what Jesus did for us on the cross. And Paul, he'll also talk about this gift in Ephesians chapter 2, in verses 8 and 9. He says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done so that none of us can boast about it. It's a gift, but it's only a gift if it's received and accepted. If for Christmas this year I were to go out and I were to buy you a gift card or a gift certificate to a restaurant and you take that gift card and you place it up on the shelves and you never use it, it's not a gift. And the reason that it's not a gift is because you never used it. Well, the next step is, is you've got to believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God. And in Acts chapter 16 and verse 31, Paul and Silas, they told the Philippian jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved along with everyone in your household. Then when we get to James chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, you say that you have faith for you believe that there's one God. Well, good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. Belief is the place to start, but if it's real, it's going to be immediately followed up with repentance. And repentance, it means that we're going to change our ways. It's, a, it's going to be, we're heading this direction, and now we're going to be heading the opposite direction. Look at Acts 3, verse 19. It says, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. If you're willing to repent, then you're going to want to tell everybody your story. You're going to want to tell everybody about the difference that Jesus Christ has made in your life. Look at Romans 10, verse 9. It says, if you openly declare that Jesus is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then as believers, we seal that decision by being baptized. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. The first ever gospel sermon was preached on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, Peter, he's preaching to the crowd, and the crowd responds and says, well, what must we do to be saved? And the Bible says that Peter's words pierce their hearts, and it says in Acts 2.38, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
But I want to make sure that we understand this morning that belief, belief is not what saves us. Repenting and, and being baptized isn't what saves us. It's Jesus who saves us. In the Bible, it teaches that we want to do those things out of obedience to the one that we say that we're surrendering our life to. And Jesus, he tells us, he makes it clear. He says, if you love me, then obey my commands. But in your story, the question that you got to answer is, how is my life different since I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? There's an author and pastor by the name of Lee Strobel, and he, he's an incredible author. He's wrote some really good books, but he used to be an atheist. And he, he worked at one time for the Chicago Tribune, and uh, uh, while he was uh, working there, his wife decided that she was going to start attending church. And Lee Strobel decided that he was going to go with her, but the reason that he wanted to go with her was so that he could ridicule her and he could make fun of her. And then he started to study the scriptures so that he could prove that the scriptures weren't true. But something happened while he was studying scripture. He ended up believing the scripture is the truth, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and he would eventually go on, and he would start to work for a church. And it was while he was working for this church that he felt like God was calling him to go back to the tribune and share his testimony with a former coworker. And he said that this was a man who had always been hard and arrogant. He was always closed-minded to anything spiritual. It's a struggle. He started to question why God would even put this on his heart, but eventually he went ahead and he set up the meeting with the, with the individual. And so he goes to the guy's office and he shared his story about becoming a Christian to the best of his ability. And he, he talked to him about the church that he was now working for. And Strobel, he said that this man was completely unmoved. He said he wasn't rude about it, but he expressed absolutely no interest whatsoever. And Strobel said... And I walked out of that office and I questioned, why in the world would God send me there? That was a total failure. Well, 12 years later, a man came up to him after one of his church services was over and said, hey, I was in small group Bible study this past week, and each person was supposed to tell about the person who's made the biggest spiritual impact in our lives, and I talked about you, and I wanted to come up to you this morning, and I wanted to say thank you. And Strobel, he said to the guy, he said, I, I know that this is a big church, but have we ever met before? Because I'm sorry, I, I don't even recognize you. And he said, nope, we've never met. But 12 years ago, I lost my job, and I was in bad shape, and I called a friend of mine who worked at the Chicago Tribune, and I told him how desperate I was. And he knew that I was a handyman, and so he said, come over, and we'll pay you to do some odd jobs around the office. And he said, I was lying, laying tile down on the ground behind a cubicle on the day that you came in to share your faith. And he said, I stopped working. And I set all my stuff to the side. And from behind that cubicle, I hung on to every single word that you said. And he said, when you left that office, I said, that's what I need. And I came to church that very next, sun uh, next Sunday. And before long, I became a Christian. And soon my wife became a, a Christian. And now both of my kids are a Christian. And we owe it all to you. Guys, you never know how God could take your story and use it to touch someone, even somebody that you're not even anticipating God using it for. Back in our story, in Acts chapter 26, there's one more area that is critically important in Paul's approach with sharing his faith, and that is he's going to ask for a response. Paul is going to ask for a response. Paul has made this incredible transition. He talks about Jesus dying. He talks about Jesus coming back from the dead, and now he's going to request a, a response from King Agrippa. Let's look at verses 24 through 26. It says, suddenly, Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. But Paul replied, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is the sober truth, and King Agrippa knows about these things. I speak boldly, for I am sure that these events are all familiar to him, for they were not done in a corner. And I think what happens is a lot of times as we breeze through those first two, te two steps that Jacob talked about this morning, we, we can break down barriers. We can go out there and we, we can tell other people our story. But when it comes to asking for a response, we hesitate. We, we try to justify it to ourselves by saying, well, you know, I, I'm a silent witness. I, I let my life do the talking. And that's good, but if you never request a response, you can't expect to see many responses. I, I've never had somebody come up to me in my 39 years of life and say, Shane, I've been, I've been watching your life closely, and I notice that you don't do a lot of bad things, and because of that, I want to give my life to Jesus. No, that, that, that is probably not going to happen. Well, Paul, he shared his story. 
And Paul doesn't have the luxury of letting the king sleep on this for the night. This this is a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. He's got one shot with the most powerful man in all the land. And in verse 27, he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And right here, Paul, he's putting Agrippa on the hot seat. He, he, says, he knows that if he says no, what he's going to do is he's going to alienate the Jewish nation that he's trying to govern. But if Agrippa says yes, he's going to be put in a very vulnerable position where he's going to have to accept the Messiah. And so what he does is he tries to squirm out of the conversation with some sarcasm. He says in verse 28, do you think that you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? And Paul looks back at him. And in verse 29, he says, whether quickly or not, I pray, that both, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. And Paul had one chance, a chance to stand before the king and ask for his freedom, but instead, he's trying to set the king free. He wants to set the king free by introducing him to a relationship with Jesus Christ. When you go out and you share your story, just like Festus and Agrippa, there's going to be some who say, no, I'm, I'm not ready. I'm going to need a little bit more time. But if you tell your story, just like the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8, or just like the Philippian jailer, there's going to be people who respond with excitement. But I'll tell you this, you'll never know if you're not willing to ask. And as a church, I pray that we will have courage. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I, I thank you for all the different ways that you show us that we can get out there and we can tell others about you. And I pray that as a church, we will be on a passionate pursuit to reach the one. And so God, I pray that you use us and you, use, you, you let us use the story that you've given us to reach this world. God, help us to do big things. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Church, if you'll stand with us. Let's worship together. Every time I try time I try to stand and start to fall and all those lonely roads that I had traveled on there was Jesus when life I built came crashing to the ground where the friends I had
God bless you all. It's been great to worship with you today. Hey, if there's anyone in here who is new with us today, we're just thankful that you're here. If we could get you to go out to that Next Steps area right out there, we have a gift uh, that we'd like to give you for joining us today and just want to get some information from you and just get to know you just a little bit. God bless you all. Have a great week.